So what do you think happened to the money? This is South Carolina Highway Patrol Trooper James Welsh, an award-winning trooper for his DUI arrests in 2015 and 2019. But not too long from now, you'll either be questioning his innocence or guilt. What started as a simple arrest in 2021 led to his reckoning as nearly $3,000 went missing from the evidence. In this video, we're taking you through the case of State Trooper James Welsh, and together we can decide whether he was in the right or not. On July 29, 2021, John Holliday was driving under the influence of alcohol onto Pearson Road when he rolled into the middle of a South Carolina Highway Patrol roadblock. The first trooper on the scene was James Welsh who investigated and claimed that he smelled alcohol and marijuana on him and asked him to get out of his car. All right, Mr. Holliday, how much have you had to drink? Uh, just half an hour. Welsh gets into Holliday's car to move it out of the road. Another trooper named Will Baker begins putting Holliday through the paces when Welsh radios something to Baker that ended the testing. But as Welsh enters the car, he finds a bag of drugs on the front seat and two bags of cash in the back. The game? Semi. Yeah, but I just can't, you know, like once I get run, and that's all I got is my word. But once I get run, it's over. It, it, it ain't nothing I can be able to talk about. This wasn't just a couple hundred bucks. Just by the first sight, it looked as if it was hundreds of thousands. So the trooper first asked him about the suspicious amount. How much money do you think that is? I don't even know. To tell you the truth, yeah. I don't know. Is that yours? Your money? Mm -mm. That's somebody else's money? You transport them? Yeah, I just... Somebody asked me to do him a favor. And I pay and you to move it. The troopers later got Holiday out of the car, and Welsh drove with the three bags to the Troop 1 office where they would be bagged for evidence. He left Holiday with Baker, and while he was searching him, he found some cash on Holiday, which also needed to be bagged into evidence. Baker immediately called Welsh about what he should do with the money, as Welsh had already left with the three bags. I've never, I've never got this much currency where I'm dealing with it myself, so I just want to make sure there's no, nobody saying that we're doing any funny stuff. Welsh placed the bags into the back of his patrol car and drove back to Troop 1's Sumter office. Welsh later said he gathered three bags of cash from inside Holiday's car, the two bags troopers found inside the car, and a clear plastic evidence bag Welsh used to bag more money he found inside Holiday's console. Welsh loaded three bags into his car at the roadblock, but carried only two bags inside the office. SCHP evidence technician Corporal Matthew Nix also made his way to the patrol office to meet the troopers that night. Nix's responsibility was to take the cash back back to the patrol's central evidence facility in Columbia and to make sure every dollar seized was properly counted. The troopers separated the cash into denominations, then stacked the bills in such a way they could efficiently count the dollar amount. The tally sheet the troopers created that night shows 4,899 bills, each of which had to be accounted for. The patrol policy required the troopers to perform a count then Nix to perform a second count. Both counts had to match before Nix could bag the money and leave with it. But that did not happen. After hours of counting, Nix left the patrol office after he and Welsh determined there were 4,899 bills totaling $110,482. Nix placed the cash into three separate evidence bags and took the money to the CEF and placed it into a safe. On August 3rd, a patrolman in the forfeiture division took the money to the bank to be counted and to have a cashier's check made out to the federal government. After three separate counts using automated currency counting machines, the bank found a $3,140 discrepancy between what the troopers and Nix claimed on their tally sheet and the amount that truly existed. Nix was called into his captain's office that day, the same day when the process to open a criminal investigation was started. After he was read as Garrity writes, he explained the events of the night exactly the way it was portrayed in the video and dash cam footage. Now, we just need to know how he logged the drugs and cash into evidence. Started on the ones, I counted all the ones and wrote them on my tally sheet. And I started on the fives and kept going until I got about, I got to the twenties. Within all of the cash that was laid out, the $20 bills was by far the most we had to count in, in number. Um, by the time they got through with the hundreds and fifties, they had already started on the twenties and got a big portion of them counted. When I say a big, they got a pile of them counted out. I don't know how many they were. It was enough. 
but they were still counting the 20s. Corporal Wells, about somewhere in the middle while they were counting the 20s, um, told Baker to let him type the statement because he knew the details as far as what went on because Baker was also dealing with the violator because he was DUI and he was going through the field sobriety process and, and doing the breathalyzer and all that good stuff. So Cam, oh, sorry, I'll keep going. That's okay. Well, you've established his first name as Cam, so yes. you're good. You okay. can make names, Cam. Okay. <laughs> so Cam basically wanted to help him out with the statement because he knew more of the in vehicle particulars mm -hmm. that Baker did not know this from what I gathered. Baker was dealing with the DUI. He was not dealing with the car. He had to right. concentrate on him. So Cam wanted to help him out with the statement part and you know where the cash was, what was going on in the vehicle, and as far as that on the statement part portion of it. So when Cam started typing on the on the computer, Baker got up and helped him record to make tally. I was still working on my, my own personal one. So, I'm just trying to let you catch up. No, you're good. Go okay. ahead. Yeah, don't talk. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> we're going to go back all over this, so cool. it's all good. Gotcha. So, when I started counting, or when I got to the part portion where I was going to start counting 20s, I asked them which stack they had finished with. I'll start on that one. That way we're not hitting each other and messing up each other's tablet. So they said, okay, we're done with these. So I took these and put them on my desk, which was separate from where they were sitting because I, I wanted to not get involved with them, they not get involved with me. And I started counting. And when I got done with my stack of 20s, I said, did y'all separate these out and know how many you had here? Yes, how many do you have? Um, I don't remember exact numbers, but we were off. And I was like, okay. I just, my head dropped. Because I know it took me almost an hour to count the stack of 20s that I was counting. And I said, we're already off. Let's stop. Yeah. We got to back up and punt. Now you said you're off. So did they have more or less I, than you? I don't you, remember. That's okay. I do not remember. I just knew we were off. And, that, and I knew we had more than twice as many to go. Right. So we were just going to get worse and worse and worse as we went on. So... That was about time the time Cam was started back counting again. So at that point, it was three of them counting and one of me counting. Okay. And it was probably getting close to, I uh, guess, about 1 a.m., 2 a.m. area. We've been there for a while counting. So Corporal Wells and I decided, look, all right, let, let's figure out a way that we can stack these 20s up and try to get an accurate count because I, we can't leave here until we're both in agreement mm -hmm. that this is what we got. So what we did is basically start over on the 20s. The 100s were right, the 50s were right, the 10s were right, the 5s and the 1s were right. We were dead set on planting our flag on our numbers, on our tallies, on those right. denominations. So what we did is we took the whole stack of 20s and everybody grabbed some, okay? Everybody being who? All four of us. Okay, and so we you, started Cam, Baker, Baker and Riker. And Riker. So okay. we, we put all the 20s in 50, counts of 50, 50 bills. And we had them laid out on both sides of that big long partition, on the desk on the side, by the window, well, yeah, it was by the other computer desk over here on the uh, far side, and then the desk I was working on, we had stacks of 50 on that. From his side of the story, he's portraying himself as a stickler to the rules, someone who wanted to make sure the count was 100% accurate. This could be perceived as a way that he's trying to avoid suspicion, rather than actually instructing his subordinates. But right now, it's too early to tell. So once we got all that separated out I think there were two stacks on the computer desk that were not quite at 50 and on my desk I had a short stack that wasn't quite 50. Okay. And then once we were in agreement that we had $50 stack, well, I say $50, 20, 50, yes. I understand what you mean. 50 bills 50, yes. on each stack we started counting stacks and I had my cell phone calculator 
and I was doing the math on that. And then Cam went back and counted his 50, 50 bill stacks. And then of course we manually counted the short stacks and got a number. And we were both in agreement at that time that I believe it was 4301 was the total amount that we had. Bills, $4,301 bills. Right. Yes. He and I both were in agreement. We signed our tally sheets and then I took that cash and I put it in 500 or five, yeah, 500 $20 increments and rub and, rub and banded them up. Okay. And within that I had we I got had some evidence bags in my little go bag that I take on seizures and stuff that it was the largest um, evidence bags that we have. And two of the bags were full of the twenties but nothing but 20s. And the other bag had the hundreds, fifties, tens, fives, and ones in it. So you had a total of three bags? Three bags. Okay. And again, make sure everybody was good to go. Everybody's planted their flag. That's the number we're going with. And I took that cash, put it in my patrol vehicle, and drove to Columbia to shop right. All right, so you leave, you leave Sumter and you go to Columbia. Yes. Where did you place the money when you left Sumter and went to Columbia? In my back seat. Were the bags sealed, the evidence bags, yes. were they sealed? Yes. I signed the bag and dated it, but I did not sign the seal again. I signed it's always 2020. It's all right. So you, you signed actually on the front on, of the bag yes. or the back of the bag? on the front of the bag with a date. Of, I think at that time it was right at 3 a.m., so it was a bit on the 29th. July no recounts, no checks. He simply relied on the count of the troopers, summed it up, and delivered the final count, which was reported to be exactly $110,482. The possibility that it was one of the troopers' miscounts still exists, because he claimed to be counting the 20s, and he roughly remembers the amount to be above 80 grand, or $86,020 according to the tally sheet. The interrogator needs to know where could the slip-up have taken place. So she asks more about the process. It's not the process that was at fault here. If we look back at the timeline, the count took place on the night of the arrest, which was July 29th. The patrolman reported the error in the count on August 3rd. Between these dates, Welsh had a three-day weekend, which started right after the arrest. But two days later, which would be August 1st, he found one bag of cash in the back of his patrol car. Whether it was left there intentionally or mistakenly depends completely on how he handled the situation. So I was um I was scared. Um, the following day, I I called my stepdad, who's the sheriff of Clarendon County. Um, I always call him for advice and stuff, and we sat there and talked about it. And he told me, he said, you know, just call Paige, get this straight, you know. But it was later on that evening when I talked to him and. So I said, well, I'm working tomorrow. I said, I'll go in before work and I'm gonna call Paige and go by and see her and figure out what the best way to get this turned in with the least amount of damage to me. And I'll try to get this figured out. Well, didn't have time because the, this would be the third. That, mo that morning I got up, um, had to go do a little small little job. I have a plumbing, plumbing at home repair business. I'm a contractor. So I had to run into town, take care of something. It took about 30 minutes, and I was gonna go home and go back to sleep. Well, anyway, um, I was on my way home that morning. Nick's called me, and he told me that they were missing three thousand or over three thousand dollars from the final count. Or they took the money to the bank, and the bank says it was only like 107, something like that, and we counted like 110. So I said, dude, I don't know, have a clue what's going on with that. I said, but I, I just went ahead and told him then. I said, listen, I found an evidence bag of money in my car. I said, it's not $3,000. I said, so it has, and it wasn't even counted. This fell in between the briefcase and my back seat. I said, so it has nothing to do with the missing money. I said, but tell me what I need to do to get this turned into evidence. I said, uh, Cam, go through your chain of command, inform your sergeant of, of the situation that you just told me get ahead of this before it starts looking worse than it already is. Right. I said, because our count that we had in the Sumter office is way off, way off, that 
just does not help. Nick's told me then that I needed to contact my chain of command, which I did. I called Pate or Sergeant DeBose. Um, then I called Lieutenant Dan back. And, um, Dan back. D-A-N. D-A-C-K. Do you know Lieutenant Dan Bat's first name? Mark. Okay. Yeah. So then I, um, I called them. I was already getting dressed because Matt told me, he said, just come on up to Central Evidence. And so I was in route to Central Evidence, went ahead and got dressed like because I had to work that night anyway. And um, spoke with Dan back and all them. I got to Central Evidence. Talked with Matt. Matt told me that I needed to go to Troop One headquarters and turn the evidence in over there. So I went over there, turned the evidence in to Lieutenant Danback and Captain Chris Shelton. S H E L T O M. Okay. Um, they counted it. It came up to be over eight hundred dollars. Um, Danback and Shelton counted the money. They did in front of me. It was $894. Um, after that, we honestly sat around and waited a while, and then Major Patterson, that's Everett Patterson, showed up and gave Lieutenant Shelton, or Captain Shelton, a uh, piece of paper, and he read it to me and notified me that I was suspended. The money he found in his car was $894, not $3,100. What doesn't make sense here is that he discovered the money in his car on August 1st, came to work on August 2nd, and didn't notify his chain of command about the money. According to the patrol records, he just worked a shift and didn't meet with Sergeant DuBose to tell her about the evidence. On August 3rd, just before Welsh started his shift, Nix called him and said that $3,000 was missing from the count. To which Welsh said that, quote, I don't have a clue what's going on with that. He went a full two and a half days hiding the fact that he had uncounted money left in his car, but reported the evidence bag to his supervisors on August 3rd, which contained the $894. It is also interesting to note that he called his stepdad rather than his superior officer directly. This could be perceived as a sign of nepotism. Maybe he wanted his help to bail him out of a situation. This is something the interrogator addresses as well. Until we get this resolved. All right. Instead of calling your stepdad, why didn't you call Paige? On Monday. I don't know. Just freaked out. Just dumb, dumb on my part. Scared to death. Because now it looks like, yeah, oh, know. look, hey, look, Nick oh, brings God. it to your attention. And oh, you're like, oh, yeah, by the way, Sunday night I found, you know, here we are two days later. Oh. Um, so that's where there's a lot of concerns there. There is. Um, so. Based off of this, we haven't been over your, your type statement yet. Did you take any of that money? Out of? Out of that seizure that y'all had. Absolutely From the not. time you left that checkpoint to the time you went to post A, and from the time you were at post A by yourself, did you take any of that money? No, ma'am. Um, Do you think anybody else had the opportunity to take Absolutely it not. And one thing I will say, because um, I've, I've been thinking of a hundred different ways of how this could have happened. We were all together. I never even walked to my private personal office the entire time we were there. Never left the room. Um, nobody left. We all sat in the common area, I guess you could call it, the entire time. The amount of missing money, and I know it's only in 20s, because they did tell me all the other denominations were correct. It was only 20s. That amount, that's over 150 bills. That's thick. Our uniforms are tight. I mean, they're, 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 I can barely put keys in my pocket <laughs> in my uniform. There's no fit in a cell phone in your pocket, no nothing. Um, it would have been very, very obvious if anybody would have stuck grabbed a couple of three stacks or more, more than three stacks, stuffed it in their pockets. So what do you think happened to the money? I have no clue. Do you think it's possible that y'all did not count the money correctly? I think we should have, we should have done a much better job of counting. Do you um, think it's possible anybody took the money? Let me just make, ask that for clarification. There's no way. Okay. I mean, 
Everybody that I have dealings with, I'll tell you, Matt, I'd bet my job on him. He wouldn't take a penny. My two boys that were with us, Baker and Riker, they wouldn't take a penny. I, I know I would. I don't need it. I mean, not just saying. I mean, I work hard. I have a, I have a plumbing business that I make triple what I make with Highway Patrol. I mean, I just don't need. I've got eleven, almost eleven years in. I wouldn't need that. Matt, uh, Matt's got. He's got a ton of time. He's got more time than I do. He did my background investigation back when I started. Yeah. I mean, he and I, I mean, we're not, I consider him a dear friend. I mean, we don't hang out socially. I only see him when we're in uniform. But, I mean, he's he's a great guy. I trust him with my life. I trust him with that money. And the state should, too. I mean, that's, it's got to be a miscount. Um, would you be willing to uh, do a polygraph? Absolutely. Welsh was polygraphed on August 13th, and again on August 31st. SLED records show deception indicated on both polygraph results. The patrol completed the investigation on October 1st and shared that, quote, there is lack of substantial evidence to prosecute the above subjects, which were James Welsh, W.E. Baker, Matthew Nix, and Zachary Rickard, now quoting again, for a violation of the criminal laws of the state. They also stated that the four officers, quote, did not perform their duties in a workmanlike manner, and, quote, several policies were not followed, leading to a miscount of the seized funds. The file was sent to Sumter County Solicitor Chip Finney to determine whether to bring charges. On October 21st, Welsh received a letter from SCDPS Director Robert Woods, notifying him the patrol's internal investigation found multiple violations against him. The investigation found Welsh failed to count and document the seized cash in accordance with patrol policy, and Welsh mishandled evidence and inappropriately stored the money in his patrol car. But more importantly, Welsh destroyed slash deleted agency documents by resetting his state cell phone. That's right. After the interrogation ended and the investigation began, he was asked to return his department-issued cell phone, which surprisingly was factory reset. The SCDPS director Robert Woods wrote to him on October 21st that Quote, you advise the OPR that due to having personal contact information saved in your issued cell phone, you wanted to reset the contact list to remove those contact numbers before turning it in. You claimed that it was only your intent to reset the contact list and to not wipe all the data from the phone. You acknowledge that you should not have factory reset your issued cell phone and that having personal cell phone numbers on the phone was not a legitimate reason for you to attempt to reset the phone's contact list. In a twist of fate, Welsh's suspension from August 3rd to October 21st was finally vindicated as the patrol acknowledged its mistake and compensated him with long overdue back pay. However, the repercussions of his ordeal didn't end there. A heavy blow came crashing down as Woods informed Welsh of his demotion from the esteemed rank of corporal to the humbling position of Lance Corporal. And even though the $3,000 was never recovered, it was covered by slashing a staggering $11,219 from his hard-earned paycheck. Meanwhile, Corporal Matthew Nix also found himself entangled in the web of investigation, as he was also accused of failing to adhere to the meticulous money counting and documentation procedures outlined by SCHP policy. The allegations didn't stop there. Whispers suggested that Nix had gone a step further, allegedly pocketing seized cash for personal gain. In a surprising turn of events, the report from the Office of Professional Responsibility, or OPR, unveiled a mixed bag of findings. Now, while the accusation of personal use was tagged with a puzzling, not sustained label, the failure to adhere to proper counting procedures was indeed proven. Nix was granted his share of back pay for the period of his suspension, and the price he paid for his misconduct was the deduction of eight hours of Nix's hard-earned wages. Though both Welsh and Nix continue to serve within the ranks of the esteemed Highway Patrol, their careers forever bear the weight of these disciplinary actions. The award-winning trooper who was considered a champ at DUI arrests will now be remembered as a former stealer who got demoted. And while it sounds like Nix simply got tangled in the mess, we can't rule out his involvement since Welsh did a pretty good job in wiping the evidence. The truth will be mysterious, but the repercussions will haunt these two for quite some time. And as always, thanks for watching.
In this day and age, qualified immunity remains one of the deadliest threats to U.S. citizens. There is no doubt, and as witnessed daily, that as long as police officers in our uncivilized nation are encouraged to murder without consequences, we can expect no improvements to our life expectancy. According to the United States National Academy of Sciences, and I quote, police in the United States kill far more people than do police in other advanced industrial democracies. To date, Colorado, New Mexico, and New York have repealed qualified immunity, and we remain hopeful that in the near future, serial killers with badges will be held accountable for the unreasonable execution of citizens. Furthermore, the Academy of Sciences additionally says, journalists have stepped into this void and initiated a series of systematic efforts to track police-involved killings. And I bid to you, my fellow citizens, that this rampage of certified murders must be stopped for the safety of our children, handicapped, and veterans. Please support the new Institute for Justice and their Americans Against Qualified Immunity campaign. Check them out at www.aaqi.com. You'll also find them on Facebook and Twitter. That's Americans Against Qualified Immunity. That's all for now, my brothers and sisters. Stay safe and always film the police.